Hey everyone, hope all is well. My name is Miles Dyer and welcome to the quest for global empathy. I hope that everyone is doing well despite these difficult times we find ourselves in. And I just want to say a huge thanks once more to everyone who has headed over to patreon.com forward slash Miles Dyer and become a supporter to help keep this show as an ongoing reality. We're starting to really ramp up the episodes now, We've got a lot of great guests coming on in the not too distant future. And if you get a backstage pass, you'll be able to tune in live during these recordings. And when we have time, ask the guests questions yourselves. And with all that said, I'm so excited about today's episode. My guest is Owen Eastwood, and he is the author for Belonging, the Ancient Code of Togetherness. He is one of the most in-demand performance coaches in the world, who has worked with a wide variety of elite teams and groups, including Gareth Southgate's England football team, the South African cricket team, corporate leadership teams, and the command group of NATO. And with all that said, he joins us now. Owen, thanks for coming on the Quest for Global Empathy. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm bloody excited about it. I'm really, I'm really glad. We had a, a really cool pre-show talk, and uh, I mentioned that I am not a particularly huge sports fan. Um, I do watch um, international football because it's a great chance for people to feel unified. It's something that friends and family talk about and that will no doubt play into a lot of the concepts you deal with in your new book, Belonging, the Ancient Code of Togetherness. And there is just so much to cover within that book. And what I really like about it is you give a lot of concrete examples of different teams you've worked with. And it's probably worth specifying that it's not just sports teams that you do work with as a performance coach. Um, so I guess as a starting point, um, I know in previous conversations you've mentioned how many of us feel in life when it comes to going into professions that it's kind of an accident, it's one thing after the other. But I was wondering if you could start with by talking about your journey and how you ended up getting into this space, because it's quite specific. Mm. Yeah, well, it was quite accidental, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> uh, unlike you, I was a complete sports nut growing up. Um, but I think I understand why that was better now. Um, in belonging, you know, I do go into quite a lot of my own story. But, and the reason I've done that is because I don't believe people should listen to someone because they're a so-called expert um, or they have letters or credentials. I, I think when I read a book, I want a connection with the writer. I want to be able to establish some sort of relationship and make my own assessment as to how credible they are as a storyteller. So I felt like, although it wasn't natural for me, I'm quite a shy person, I felt like I had to tell my own story in order to get credibility of the of the reader. And then I could take them into some places and stories um, around my experiences and, and hopefully they would get more out of them rather than just telling them this is the truth. So sport was really important for me. And actually part of that was, you know, my, as I talk about in the book, my father died very suddenly when I was five and my mother, who was 39, had a 12-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 5-year-old and a 3-year-old. And, you know, we all have different coping mechanisms, I suppose. But my one really, we lived in a very um, rural area and I would just go out into the paddock and kick a ball from the moment. Um, you know, the sun came up to when the sun came down, and in the in the summer, do the same with the cricket bat and ball, just by myself most of the time. And it was a, it was obvious. I can see now as a real form of escapism. And then I would go and watch our local rugby team, who were quite good play, and and they I felt good about myself watching them beat these teams from bigger places. So get so all these things sort of fed into my wellness, I believe. And actually, during the lockdown we've had, you can, I think it's also sharpened people's focus around this. That for, for many people, sport, but for other people, other things. But sport is an escapism. I, I, I've always seen it in that way. I don't think it's better than any other sector, that's for sure. I think there's a lot of BS that goes with it. But it is always, and still is for me, an escapism. I was very lucky. I was a lawyer for 20 years, and I managed to somehow escape that as well. But that was, un <laughs> that was unintentional. I didn't really mean to, but... I started practicing a bit of sports law and started getting connected with people in sport. And I suppose once you build a relationship, even if you're a lawyer, you become a bit of a trusted advisor. I mean, I think actually that's the gold standard of a lawyer is being a trusted advisor. <laughs> you know, and they start, they, they, therefore people start talking to me about anything. And all of a sudden, you know, some of the actual 
leadership challenges, performance challenges with stuff that people started talking about. And, you know, I would just be part of the conversation. And after a while, people started asking me, well, do you want to actually, you know, maybe help on this side of things? And it just sort of built up over time to the point where I became full time, what I call a performance coach, focused and specialized on team culture and leadership. And when you were a lawyer, was this sense of the importance of belonging and that kind of ethos, did that feed into a lot of the work? Because, I mean, a lot of people assume that just being a lawyer is a very cold-hearted profession where it's about, you know, regardless of what the facts are, this is who you've got to defend and that's it, for example. I mean, and uh, at the start of your book, based on um, the adversity that you went at a very young age, you, you wrote about a letter that you wrote to a tribe and they responded with I think it was just the words you belong and that Mm. was really the start of your journey so so I've sort of gone with two sort of things there um but like this 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 notion of belonging that has obviously led all the way through your career how was that in the work as a lawyer because you say you did it for 20 years yeah no I definitely you know law has got a certain perception but to me it was far from from that cold-hearted um way that some people might look at it it was you know the reason i got into it was because law is actually a a wonderful way to help people who maybe don't know how to protect themselves maybe have had their rights um infringed you know maybe the government big corporations have um you know misled them injured them all of those things so for me that was actually my motivation to be a lawyer and um, when I practiced it, I was surrounded by really, really, you know, people who shared that uh, ideal. So that was a that was a great, um, you know, experience and environment. I think the belonging thing is a bit separate. Okay. And yeah, so, but to, uh, I, I think when I was practicing law, and I was a partner in a law firm, so I was sort of one of the leaders, I suppose we didn't think about belonging we didn't actually understand how important it was from a performance point of view and you know just to replay that every single human being has and always will have a need to belong to a group of people and there's very powerful evolutionary reasons for that you know we we left the jungle and and our former primates went into the open grasslands um, and we were very very vulnerable Um, unlike just cruising around the jungle hunting and gathering and you know not necessarily having to be great at working as a team out in the open grasslands we were very vulnerable and we had to learn to protect each ourselves by protecting each other Um, but we also had to learn to to go and hunt together had to be very coordinated and had to to sort of submit to what was best for the group Um, and when we were not in a group and we were in that environment you know we we still do have an incredible anxiety attack so when we're with a group of people we don't feel safe with we don't feel we're part of has an incredible hormonal biological impact on us it's not just a psychological theory so that, that's always been the case always is and it's, it's quite incredible how much how sophisticated we are and how much science we understand yet this is often completely lost um, certainly in high performance sport I've, I've seen that but as a law as a lawyer we had a really group of super smart people they never ever would think about our need to belong and how they wanted to curate the environment to provide that for people. And you, t- you yeah, talk, so. you talk a lot about the fact that uh, these ancient traditions of belonging, as you say, when we were more organised in tribes of the day to day tasks of survival, um, it's now caught up with the science. And you know, this is what we learn whenever we look at science research: is it's not like it's truth and it exists once we discover it. It's like no, it's about understanding natural law and the biology of how we all function and actually you know the the traditions and again a lot of the examples you give had really helped me make a bit more tangible um things that I'd been aware of throughout my life and in in the work that I do but I hadn't quite put my finger on um that there's I would love for you to elaborate on this but in the book you talk about um manner um the concept around it's not quite the same as respect i mean respect is quite a narrow form but manner is more about um sort of the relationship with others and how it sort of goes backwards and forwards um which really struck with me because whenever i think in my life of 
my one of the my favorite feelings in life is to have mutual respects with other people like i love going to events or being involved in projects and when someone i respect expresses that to me it's the best feeling ever because mm. it gives you a sense of belonging um among value lines for example well you know that's definitely a strong theme in the book is that our ancestors i believe had a better understanding of what makes teams strong and what makes them weak than we do now because they literally only had each other they didn't have corporations they didn't have data they didn't have strategy they didn't Warlords. have <laughs> absolutely yeah, correct they had each other and for them it was a matter of survival so what you would do within a group which would screw them up they were very very aware of also what you could do in a group to make it strong and safe they were very aware of and what i'm sort of fortunate is my i grew up in new zealand um, i'm a very proud new zealander my ancestry is really um, english irish and maori the indigenous people of new zealand and then and the maori people in a lot of polynesian cultures and and cultures in asia and africa have actually done an incredible job of passing down that wisdom through generations in a very undisrupted way. Um, it, it, the ancient Polynesian navigators who were, were you know, a, absolutely epic and, and without any instruments, without any maps, without a written language, navigated 25% of the Earth's surface. Um, we know a lot about how they went about it, how their navigators led the culture on the walker, on the boat. <laughs> It's because it's been passed down through oral history. So we're really, really, really lucky. And I, I obviously use some of those ideas in my work, but I also put them into the book and explain where they come from and explain how they actually are expressed in environments as diverse, even as England football team. They, they, you know, the culture today under Gareth Southgate, you know, does. It, it actually replicates some really powerful ideas from ancient wisdom. Um, and But there are lots of other places do the same thing. And I, uh, the feedback I've got on the book is that, you know, people enjoy the fact that there's some substance to the, the to these ideas. You know, there's, the science does uh, validate it, but actually our ancestors understood it before the science proved it. Yeah, and, and, and the storytelling notion makes it much more easy for people to comprehend because it, it provides examples. Although I have to say, it's something I often talk with my international friends, which is when it comes to, you know, what it is to be English. Um, it's always a question that I struggle with um, in terms of, I think a lot of the times in the media, in our politics, it's all with the, you know, the, tr you know, the old school pageantries like the royal family or, you know, the flag, um, which, you know, if people identify with that, you know, and that gives them, you know, a sense of belonging and identity, then I think that's great. I'm someone who's personally not a royalist. Um, I respect aspects of, you know, the royal family members as human beings and, and the work they do. But I find that there's this real struggle, cultural struggle, I think, happening in the modern age where I feel that England doesn't have a modern identity because when it's led forward by our leaders and I could be wrong in this I'm just sort of expressing my own sort of mm. um, insight in and in perspective on this that it always seems to be a throwback to traditional institutions um, and there was a great there was many great quotes in the book but there was one about the idea that um, each generation has an obligation as a cultural guardians not to preserve the status quo but to strengthen it and for me that has always been at the heart of what I try and do in activism and in education it's to try and make people look towards new horizons you know you take from legacies before you and you use that to you know advance newer ones but again and again in our politics it seems to be always about looking back and you know holding on to the status quo in some ways and um you know, without going to too many specifics, um, I'll never forget, actually, it's my local MP, but former Prime Minister Theresa May, she once said on the news uh, or at one of her speeches, um, if you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere, which I found incredibly depressing to hear because for me, because of the internet age that I'm in, I'm friends with people from all over the world. Um, I'm someone that does hope that one day we are beyond 
nation states and borders but i say that knowing that because of the world we live in now nation states and borders are imperative and necessary but there seems to be this constant conflict between the new and the old and funnily enough as someone who's not hugely into sport but does watch you know international football games um the conversation that came around england in euro 2020 um about you know this is the new modern England team and these are our values. And it was sort of like strong liberalism in a lot of ways about compassion and empathy. It was the first time in a long while that I've seen a traditional medium like, you know, football, but compared to stuff like politics where I felt this feels really, really modern. And um, sorry, I've I've dived into a lot of different topics there. Um, But I'm curious for your take and you're, you're welcome to start with any of the particular points that I made. Well, I'll, I'll actually start with the very powerful ancient idea of whakapapa, W-H-A-K-A-P-A-P-A, which obviously, I, I, you know, is sort of maybe the string that connects the whole book together. And this ancient idea, I, I believe, is a universal idea, even though it you know, is expressed in my own culture. I think it's a universal idea. So th- this is always my starting point when I think about these sub conversations. So in this idea, each of us are part of an unbreakable chain of people, going back to our very first ancestors, our origin story. And this can be our family, this can be a nation, this can be the England football team, this can be um, a school, you know, religion, any group of human beings, homo sapiens, this idea applies to. So we're part of this unbreakable chain of people. And we we say that, we think about our arms interlocked with the person beside us. We, We can't be broken goes all the way back to that origin story, but also goes back to the future, to the end of time. And I've mentioned this before, and I it's completely honest. When I even talk about it, like now, I'm standing and talking about it, um, I feel connected to my, not only to my father and grandparents and great-grandparents, but I actually feel connected not only to my two children, but their children their, and their grandchildren. Um, it feels It's a physical, literal thing for me. It's not just an idea. And the powerful thing about this idea is that this, there's a metaphor that the sun first shone on our first ancestors on that origin story, you know, that is the beginning of us, and has slowly moved down this line of people. So in a sense, we have always been here. You have always been part of your family. You have always been part of your school. You've always been part of the English nation. It's just that now the sun has moved on to you and shining on you. And what happens with powerful cultures is that they're very good at transmitting down the line. This is who we are, our identity. This is our purpose. This is what this is the way we want to live and what we value, our values. And each of them in the, under the sun has a time where they leave a legacy. You know, whatever they did becomes a memory that people will hold of them and changes the tribe, changes the family, changes the nation. And um, the sun is shining on you and I, my friend, right now. And the sun is shining on the England football team, for example. So what we do, and I think strong cultures do this, is they make sure that that purpose and that identity and those values are passed down mainly through storytelling, not through whiteboards and things like that, but actually what are the stories, what are the values, how were they lived before us? But really crucially, and I've learned this in my work, is that for those people where the sun is shining on now, they have to have an opportunity to reflect on all of that and be given the opportunity to adapt, adjust, maybe make changes, and then ultimately to create their own legacy. So we don't have to just inherit the things before us and comply. That's a conformist culture, not a belonging culture. What we want to do, and I've had it with sports teams where they've actually stopped when the sun has been on them, and we've had a session, I've said, There are things we want to stop now. There's a lack of kindness. There's a lack of a growth mindset. There's too much caution and risk adversity. There's things like that. We want to stop that. We want to change our identity now. And so we create a space to allow them to do it. Is that that quite a recent thing? Because, again, I think about, you know, growing up, whether it's debating in school where it's the winner of the debate you know it's about just destroying your op- 
opponent. You see it a lot on YouTube these days with discussions of so and so destroy someone, and it's about you know being right, not about understanding common truth. Um, and in sports, I can remember as a kid seeing school sports teams with parents absolutely shouting, going, you know, get them, and like just being really aggressive. Um, and you hear about things of coaches in um, at half time giving you know hair dryer treatment, screaming at the players, and the the compassion element in coaching is that something that has been quite prominent in sports teams around the world for decades, or is it something that's only recently started to become something even considered? Like, was it ever a part of convention? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, th I think that question applies beyond coaching to teaching, to managing, mm. to leading generally, to politics. Mm. Um, so I, I think there's always been a diversity in the way groups have been led. Um, but one thing I argue in belonging is that actually, and this is from talking with evolutionary psychologist Robin Dunbar, who was, you know, very famous, obviously. Um, and I had a real privilege to be able to, you know, connect with him and spend time with him. And he contributed to the book, which I'm incredibly grateful for. But one thing he explained to me, which really did surprise me, blew me away, was that that compassionate style of leadership, that very inclusive style, is it quite a democratic style and a non um, dictatorial style is our evolutionary story because un until agriculture so that, and that's only the last 10,000 years of a 200,000 year story just of homo sapiens and three three million years at least of um, humans that we mostly lived in groups of around maybe 25 people bands of 25 people or so um, and in those environments, the leader could not, could not, well, the leader was given the right to govern. It wasn't a dictatorship. They had to, and they were, could be overturned. And what was important is that they create an environment where they could be successful in terms of obviously hunting and, and gathering and all the rest of it, but also that it was a safe environment for people. And so what people historically evolutionary did not like as leaders who brought a lot of anxiety and a lot of ego to the game. So what, how he explained it to me was once agriculture was created and then these cities started to form and then these big, you know, commercialism took off and obviously it's just grown and grown, is that these became mega societies, really. They weren't, for 99% of our history, we were used to being around 25 people, maybe 50 people at times yeah. extended out. But now we become in these cities of millions and you can't have that compassionate leader model where everybody knows you know the leader knows everybody and has a relationship with everybody and is able to deal with it that way so you get these big mega managers and people have grown a tolerance that they will be egotistical and maybe narcissistic and those type of things and we've seen some pretty extreme examples in the last or well, now in the last century or so but that's not our natural way of being led and what, what i believe is in some sports teams and there's some obvious examples they are compassionate bloody good people, really good leaders, and they really want to grow and take care of people. There are other leaders who actually are obviously clearly egotistical, and more worried about their own success than they are about the people around them. But some of those ones who do that, I do think that they're mimicking stuff on TV or stuff in politics, which is a completely wrong model to have when you've got a smaller group of people that need to be led. I do think um, it... It's, it's about do we have the systems to allow for that closeness um, because as you were going through those examples I was thinking about more cliche examples like once upon a time everyone knew who their banking manager was or they knew their local doctor like most people here you know you might have your regular doctor but you don't really know them where you mm. hear once upon a time no you had the family doctor um, mm. I remember growing up actually having the family dentist that knew the whole family and stuff like that. Now it's just whoever can have a look at my teeth. And like, mm. even though those are very small examples, that really does show a lot about the fabric of society um, and that there is a lot more disconnect because we are just trying to get the jobs done. We're, we're, we're striving towards efficiencies as mm. opposed to qualitative outcomes um and it's not to say that the people working within these systems don't have the values as you say it's intrinsic to us as human beings but it's there's very much an antithesis to 
what gets rewarded um, because it is about how do we do things more efficiently for cheaper. Yeah. And so it made me, when I was looking at the book, thinking about, you talk about production lines in um, uh, factories that once upon a time, you know, people, you know, if you were hunting for food and that, you would work as a team to achieve it. Um, whereas as we had the industrial revolution and production lines, you have one job on a production line and you do that repeatedly and if you don't hit your targets you get replaced it's the cliche of the cog in a wheel um but you don't have you might be told you know what the full production line is but you are there doing just that um mm. and it's not always the case i mean last year during the pandemic when my freelance work went quite cold i actually got a job at a local factory 15 minutes from me that did um respiratory equipment for hospitals which obviously was very important during the pandemic and signed up it was a minimum wage job obviously not the sort of work i would normally do although i had no issue with doing it and it was doing the same task every three seconds for eight hours a day but i was working with teachers um business owners head chefs people from all walks of life who were all you know, let go of jobs or struggling that were doing it. And actually, we were very lucky that in our particular room, we were able to talk a lot and share experiences. And if someone needed help somewhere on the production line, we could help out. And so in that instance, we actually were very productive and had great morale because there was a sense of commonality, mm -hmm. togetherness, belonging, that we were all in this together. Um, but that is not the model that companies run on, it was uh, an anomaly. And I think something that has definitely come out of the pandemic is things that have always been the case, whether it's the fact that do people really need to travel an hour and a half each way each day and getting stressed before they even take on the task of work itself. Um, people are going, actually, no, people can work from home a bit more. Um, so there seems to be this constant um, struggle between what is right and what is kind of um seen as the usual business as usual approach yeah i think one thing that came out um of what you just said there for me was just a thought that i feel pretty strongly about is that people really have so much and, and western societies have so much undervalued indigenous cultures around the world there's been a real i mean obviously colonialism is self-explanatory around that but even today it persists these very patronizing ideas about about traditional societies but i would i i really would challenge that you know what you're talking about is and i know exactly what you, you know when i was a kid growing up the doctor would come to our house and actually that was an important part of the process because often they that was giving them clues as to how the well-being of everybody was and how the things were working um you know now yeah you're right I, i'm allowed a like a five minute phone call and it takes about a month to have it. I don't have any face time and I don't have a relationship. Human being, the need to belong is part of the wider point, which is that human beings are incredibly relational. That's what we are. You know, our well-being is dependent on our relationships. You know, and that's, yeah, that's just simply a, a medical scientific fact. You know, that our bad health outcomes are associated with loneliness and self-isolate or isolation sense of rejection, et cetera, right? You know, we and the same pain areas of our brain are triggered by that sense of, you know, isolation as it is from physical pain. So those traditional societies are actually very, very good at making sure that everything is built around relationships. So they're not looking for the most efficient processes um, in order to commoditize things and depersonalize things and reduce face time. You know, that's not what they're about. It goes against their whole way of understanding you know well-being i actually think we should go should look at and learn from them a lot more than we do you know i don't like what you know how you you know what you explained there in terms of the direction we're going in the, the factory line mindset for me you know and I th you know other people smarter than me have identified this that once we actually got into that industrialization and like the, the you know the, the the production line mindset it just changed the way we were led and managed to a large degree rather than focusing on the relationships between people and the particular relationship between the manager and the individuals it all became about the process the, the hero became the process rather than the people 
And so people also saw that those things were a linear process as well. So if something wasn't done, you could pretty much identify where it went and then you could start, you know, getting rid of people and get someone in who would do a better job, which obviously creates a lot of anxiety and is a complete opposite of a sense of belonging. So yeah, that's from a belonging point of view, I think that has not been helpful. And there's also this discussion, you talk a lot in the book about Robert Sapolsky, who I absolutely, I'm a huge fan of, and about his book Behave, in which yeah. he addresses this notion about collectivism versus the individual. Um, this is something I'm always having conversations with friends about. I have some friends who are strong libertarians. Um, it's some in America who really don't like um the vaccine mandate or wearing masks it's all about individual freedom we can't get rid of that for the sake of collectivism and like many discussions in politics i always find i take the unsexy answer so for example if it was about is it we hate big government it's all about small government for me it's like it's not either or it depends what we're talking about um, some might argue the military industrial complex, you don't want big government there, but you do actually want a big veterans program to take care of people that put their lives on the line to defend a country. Um, and it's the same with the whole issue about collectivism versus individualism. Um, I think that personal freedom is really important, but you can only be as free as the society that you live in. And so I'll never forget that when the, the, the pandemic first kicked off i was seeing in some live chats that i was attending people saying oh i'm all good i've i've got private insurance so i'm covered and i was like you don't understand actually having a national health service means other people don't get sick who could then pass it on to you and i think that a lot of western cultures you know the american dream that anyone could be the president of the united states I do really appreciate that notion of individual empowerment and I think that it does play a role in society but the key word there is society and society is about what everyone else is doing as well is the environment that you in clean is there good mental health and well-being to cover other people um you know some people are against the idea of a national health service because they're like why would I pay taxes higher taxes to ensure that other people get health care when I don't need it. And for me, it's like, I actually want people to be taken care of. Like, that's just how I feel because it's the golden rule, isn't it? In in most scripture and um, religions and beliefs, which is, you know, treat as others as you'd like to be treated. It's realizing that if you take care of other people that are going through adversity and everyone feels the same, it means that you're also covered when you're going through it as well. And so this debate about if something is selfless or selfish, I always find it's kind of in the balance, like when you do something good for someone else, you feel good about it. And that is a totally fine thing to be okay with, you know, to feel good about doing good things. And these are kind of the behaviors that we need to um, to nurture more. But um, yeah, I was just love to hear more of your thoughts about this idea of collectivism versus um, individualism in society as a whole. But also I'm curious to know how that does play in things like sports where team sport it kind of makes sense collectivism but in a individual sport where you're on your own there's it's more about individualism but of course there is a team of coaches and people behind the scenes but um yeah just those two things again sorry really big broad broad points here we're dealing with well there are big issues uh well i I think that we are naturally collectivist Mm -hmm. in fact i I think that's pretty self-evident for a species that for 99 percent of our human history we were hunter gatherers yeah it's the last one percent that we've gone some some of us not all of us some societies have gone off in a highly individualistic way i don't i actually don't, i don't think that's our natural state i've been asked in the past you know what's your personal purpose and what's your personal values and and I, i've always struggled with those questions because to me it's not about my purpose it's about the purpose of the groups I belong to. And that's what is motivates me. And that's where I feel like I, I want to help. Um, and I, you know, I sense you very much the same way. So uh, in my work as a performance coach, this actually is the challenge is that we get, uh, pe- you know, particularly in Western countries. And I, I work with very diverse teams, the South African cricket team I've worked with. I think our best 11 would have six different cultures and religions amongst that. 
some of them very collectivist, you know, the indigenous Africans and and then I would say the Muslim players as well, and some less so. Um, you know, more more individualistic, the you know the Afrikaners and English speaking white players. So that they're all actually conditioned. That's the I think the word is how you are conditioned. I do think our essence is very much collectivist, and our need to belong is part of that. But I, I think we're conditioned in different ways depending on where you grow up. And I think, you know, what, whatever nest, you know, the stalk dropped you in, or whatever Robert Sapolsky's quote is around that. So as part of the, as a performance coach, hundred percent, we, we can't have half the team who are wandering around just completely obsessed with their own self-interest. You know, how much they're getting paid, how much celebrity they're getting, how many social media likes. You know. Mm. Um, how big their house is and the endorsements and all the rest of it, we, and, the, and the other half committed to the cause. So that's where you know skillful leadership comes in, and I think this is going to be a challenge, which is just going to get you know sharper and sharper for coaches, and, and something they can't avoid going forward is that they are going to have to establish these cultures where there is something bigger than the individual to really strive for and buy into. And again. That ancient idea I spoke about is part of an unbreakable chain of people, and the sun moves on us. And you know, this is something that the England football team have done, and you know, other teams have done that I've worked with. Is that that can be incredibly motivating and and build a lot of cohesion when we actually together have a big chat about now as a group of people, what could we achieve? What is the impact we could have on the world? What would they maybe say in the future about what we've done? Um, and how do we want to go about it? And how do we want to connect with people? And and what I think that's the work that needs to be done. Uh, it's not a matter of just pointing at people and saying, "Don't be selfish." I, I think that point, you know, there's point, well, <laughs> yeah, pointing but pointless at the same time. But I, I think that's the work of coaches, and that's not a traditional role of a coach. Some some have done it for a long time, but a lot of haven't. They think more about tactics and strategy and and, and planning and selection. But I do think it's becoming an increasingly part of it as to why. Why should we make the sacrifices and, and work our butts off and maybe not be selected and have to sit on the bench? Well, why should we do those things? And I think this generation and these generations and my children's generation, they're going to ask that question. Okay, I actually be prepared to work hard and sacrifice. Just want to know why. And I want to have a bit of buy into that. Mm. Well, that's what we do is we create a space where it's not the coaches and telling them this is why and this is what you must do it's a them it's literally really visualizing what they could achieve together and out of that of course they would all benefit if a team wins a competition or, or whatever it is then obviously we'll all benefit anyway um so that's uh, you know i individualistics it's not me i, I don't like that particularly I see the problems with it, but in a, in, in a sporting high performance environment, actually we can create very, very collectivist traditional societies and believe it or not. And when it comes to, you, you've touched upon it just now about dealing with teams. Um, you talk, talk a lot about the us versus them mentality. As a coach, how do you deal with the us versus them within teams where you do have players that are on the sub bench on a big international sporting event and you know they will no doubt want to go out there uh, and play and represent their country um is that something that is um are, are they are they taught not to have that feeling or is it about accepting that feeling for what it is observing it but realizing the greater picture like some tangible examples of how you deal with that mentality because especially on these big I think again about Euro 2020 and these big big matches you do want to represent your country that's why you do it um and yes supporting the team and the country but there is I just feel there's a bit of a a, a conflict of you want to represent and even though you yeah. could say sitting back and being on the sub bench is is playing your part because you're there ready when they need you there's no doubt going to be some inner disappointment there. And that's also in other environments, obviously, as well. Um, school, work, you know, lots of places where people are have a shared identity, but at the same time and they're competing with each other as well. And some people are becoming the stars and some people are less so and, and mm. there can be resentments and stuff. So, yeah, these are real issues. I mean, it's, it's a great one that you've point out so I think it's two parts to it one is what I mentioned before is allowing them together to to create 
a vision of something really cool that they all are prepared to buy into. You know, not just saying representing England, that's your job, go and do it. it actually needs to be more emotional and, and more personal than that. That's part of it. The second part of it is creating an archetype for the type of person who wears this shirt. And that is really, really important and very powerful. So it's all very well to be very proud of, you know, the team and who we play for, but we also need to create this archetype. And so, we, you know, that's where your values and things kick in because that's part of the story here that we all buy into. So, it, for example, you know, to answer your question, the archetype we have of, in our team would be, if I don't get selected, I don't act like a dickhead. <laughs> I, I, I show humility and actually I shift my focus on making sure that those who are taking the field are uh, best prepared and I will contribute to that. Yes. And I know that if I create a distraction and if I create any negativity, it will affect the energy of this team and it will hurt us and it will take us far, further away from that vision. And, and what's important about this, so we, we, and we don't just sort of, you know, I think we need to be clear on this archetype of this type of person. And, and so therefore, when someone is not living that archetype, then we would have to challenge them. And if someone is going off crazy on social media, like, you know, the coach is as clear as I should be playing and that, you know, you don't punish the person. The much more severe way of dealing with that is actually the shaming in, in a group where someone says to you, you know, we are a team, we are a tribe, and you've broken our code. That That's a horrible experience for, for players. That They hate that. They, they hate that a lot more than they do a financial fine. Right. So when you get this, get this clarity around our identity, not just as a team, but as individuals, then it really builds us up, and you get this code where the players will self-regulate it. And the beautiful thing about that is, you know, the archetype is someone which is very inclusive. It's not like, you know, Winston Churchill was like this, so we should be like this if we're going to be English. It's nothing like that at all. It's, um, it's some of the traits you talked about. It's about having being kind. It's about being understanding. It's about being humble. Um, you know, it's about wanting the best for the people around you. It's these type of things. So when someone breaks that code, it'll be dealt with. And it happens inevitably because we're human beings and we're all flawed and we all have good days and bad days. So inevitably we move away from that. As you do, I'm a dad, I'm a husband. I've got a sort of an archetype in my mind of what I want to be like. Right. Some, some days I nail it. Some days <laughs> I've had an absolute shocker. So, um, yeah, but we go back to it and, you know, the people around us remind us that, you know, that's not the best version of yourself. So th th this all takes work. You know, this is why you would even have a performance coach like me involved because it takes a lot of work and it, take, and it helps if you've got that sounding board or people bringing different experiences to help create these environments. It's not something you would necessarily learn doing a coaching course. Yeah, no, for sure. So is this probably is one of the most basic questions that could be asked, but what is it to be a performance coach like in sport? Are you there... Are you there during matches, like, or are you just there during training days? Um, where where is your presence in in the process? You know, because because a part of me feels like you're there at the front end to sort of educate, lay mm. the groundwork for the mentality in that. But then a part of me is like, do you need to be there? A question I've got for a bit later is about you know penalty shootouts and stuff. Um, are you there to help support? Because obviously, mm -hmm. in a way, you're a guru of, of mindset as well with the, with the work that you do no i definitely wouldn't say that i, mean, <laughs> I, know, I know you wouldn't okay no no, 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 I'm, no I, would, I definitely wouldn't and and I, you know, I remember as well i'm not a psychologist you know i'm, I'm a accidental lawyer who <laughs> okay. sort of tripped over is that what it says on your business card <laughs> well, i haven't got one but if i have one it probably should go on um but it's, a, it's a really good question so the way I look at it is my job is to help a team prepare to compete. And I work with business teams. I've worked with, you know, the generals in NATO, as you know, I've, I've worked with, you know, Royal Ballet School, worked with, you know, real diversity of environments. My job is to help them think through, have we got the ultimate environment that we could create here for our people to both thrive in and for us to achieve our goal? I mean, that's as simple as that. 
So it's a little bit too late um, if we're, you know, halfway through the competition and we yeah. didn't start thinking about this stuff. So my job is, is in many ways is to evaluate where they are at, number one. Number two is to work with the leaders, you know, coaches, whoever, whoever the leaders are, and design, actually proactively design what would be a great environment for our group. And therefore, we've got to address the gaps between what that would be and what we've got today. So we come up with plans and ideas around all of that. And then as we build up to competition, just as people would, you know, do their strength and conditioning, their speed work and all those things, I think we do the same culturally. We, we, we let, put layer upon layer on it as we move towards competition. Because during the competition, we want to have a real focus on, you know, the detail and this, on the specificity of how we want to play and how that's going, rather than, you know, trying to revisit well, why the hell are we even doing this and what's our culture and all these things. Mm. So if I've done my job well, it's all in the preparation. So, like, for example, the thing on football team, the Euros, you know, I might pop into camp once or twice during the tournament, but that that's my work is done before it starts. Uh, obviously, different teams, you know, coaches will reach out during the tournament and ask, you know, to deal with, with a specific issue that may arise, of course, we'll have those conversations. But, yeah, the bulk of the work is done before him. And, you know, I'm talking a long time in advance. We've got a clear design of what we're trying to do and we need to build it and build it over time. Um, so, yeah, they have a great psychologist in the football team, for example, Ian Mitchell. Um, and Pippa Grange preceded him. And they deal with the in-tournament psychology of the team and the players. And obviously my work correlates into the psychology because it's about your mindset and about about your behaviors but you know i'm not a qualified psychologist and i don't do one-on-one -on -one stuff with athletes or um and individuals I'm, I'm always looking at it from the group point of view how that's operating and do you have do you ever have conflict with other coaches because what what you're about is it's a, there is a philosophy there um and you know we were talking earlier about there are different ways of um, managing teams. Um, Gareth Southgate for the England team was clearly led on compassion, empathy, wanting a sense of collective responsibility. Um, for those that aren't familiar with sort of Gareth Southgate's story, I actually remember as a kid watching, was it in 96, his famous penalty? Mm -hmm. um, for me, penalty shootouts in football are probably one of the most stressful sporting acts you could ever be a part of because you sometimes hear people and, and this might be my naivety with sport there could be lots of other examples in other sports where it's the case but for me it's like so some people will say oh penalties they get paid enough money to practice them but for me it's like doesn't matter how many times they they shoot penalties on the practice ground you can't emulate being in the final of a World Cup and your kick is going to determine whether your whole team and the nation goes through or succeeds or not. Um, and so in 1996, Gareth Southgate took a penalty. He missed. And I remember how gutting it was. Um, and again, I, I, I would have been nine at the time. So my memory is very emotive and um, I don't really remember exactly how it went down but I felt there was a sense of he was isolated it was he was the reason that England you know didn't go through um whereas he's taken those learnings which makes his story so incredible that now he manages the England team and he takes those learnings and has compassion and so when England's were in the final taking penalties and three of our players missed he was consoling them and I felt totally different about penalties and, you know, who missed and that. It felt like there was this team, a uh, sense of um, collective responsibility among the team. And, uh, yeah, do you want to talk a bit about that sort of that ethos and obviously Gareth Southgate's journey and how that would have informed it? Because I can only speculate from an outside person looking in. Well, I, I can't really, I can't really talk for him. Sure. I think he, he has public, publicly talked about, yes. you know, those things that you've mentioned there. And you're right; he's quite unique in some ways because he's been in that place. So that must be, you know, really reassuring. 
affirming and reassuring for the players who are having a similar experience. I mean, I listen to him in a way different to other people. But you know, I think you're using the right words around there, around empathy. Um, and that's a natural thing for him. But just stepping back a bit from, from, from the England team, you know, a lot of my work is based on some pretty simple principles. And they are that homo sapiens tend to perform better in environments which are calm and consistent and have um, minimal anxiety, right? Now, obviously, when you go into high-performing sports environments in particular, but any high-performing environment, you are going to have anxiety and stress, okay? So we understand that. So the job of someone like me as a performance coach around team culture is at least, first of all, for the leaders and management to understand that actually, you, under, you know, the, this is backed by research. People tend to and um, perform better when there's less stress, when behaviour of people around them is predictable and not inconsistent. Um, and anxiety isn't just dumped in or just funneled in the whole time. And, you know, when I work as a, as a lawyer, it was a really nice culture, a very good firm, but I think there was lots of things we could have done better around that. You know, I think the envi environment was too anxious at times, and I think it drained people. And that's what happens when environments are a bit chaotic, a bit inconsistent. Maybe the manager's got a lot of mood swings and you never know exactly what's going on. Mm. Maybe there's not a sense of belonging, so you always have that anxiety as an outsider. Maybe you don't, there's not deep trust around the people. You know, you don't know them well enough. That hasn't been curated. Um, or maybe there's just an inconsistency in the way people behave and it's hard to trust them. You know, none of that is going to help you be the ultimate team you can be. So they are the things that we want to reduce. And, you know, Gareth's personality is part of it is, um, and the team are fortunate for that. But there's also a lot of intention around let's create an environment which is generally, but we know there'll be like all groups and families, there'll be moments where there's a lot of stress and mm -hmm. we have to deal with that. But as the, our normal experience together, let's have a calm, let's have clarity around what we're doing every day so it's not like big surprises. Um, let's have a very relational, so we'll, let's carve out time in our space to have com human conversations with each other and make sure our leaders understand the people, not just the performer, um, their stories and, and have a relationship. Those things are important. Let's make sure our leaders understand, even if they've had a terrible sleep, the baby's been crying all night, maybe they are in a bad mood, understand, have self-awareness that that can absolutely change the whole environment if you turn up with energy which is... Um, you know, negative. So just awareness around all that. And once everyone understands that, then we create a design and an intent around, let's make sure that we just try and live this as best we can every single day. And, you know, again, that's not necessarily a traditional environment for high performing teams and sport, but I think there is a movement towards that. And I think the science justifies it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that it only continues because Again, I think of a lot of young people um, who do watch these sports and see it. There's this connection of, you know, another world is possible. Like, you know, there are ways of doing it that show taking care of well-being actually has long-term benefits. Um, and it's, you know, it's becoming a bigger thing in wider society, whether some countries are now moving towards a four-day work week. Um traditional ways of thinking or should I say like modern tradition uh, ways of thinking are no you do more work in five days than four you know it's one more day so you're gonna be more productive but actually a lot of the evidence coming out obviously it's still out there in many parts um, is that productivity actually goes up because it's found for example that you know if you work five days a week and your two days are to relax well actually those two days you're doing housework you're dealing with bills and all these other things and you know errands um whereas when they have a four day week what actually happens is they use that fifth day to do the errands and that and then they actually get to rest and they come into work monday feeling better um and so there really does seem to be this i, I like to think science-led approach that is becoming more dominant i mean a lot of big corporations are going to want to do it if it improves 
the output and again productivity but then on the flip side you see examples like amazon uh which in their warehouses are giving people reportedly 15 minute breaks takes them five minutes to get to the break room five minutes for a break and then five minutes to get back all sorts of horrible conditions where they're doing things that i can't even imagine wanting to do in a work environment but people are desperately Mm -hmm. trying to make a living and for me it's like with corporations that big that are stuck in those ways where there's kind of this race to the bottom is there hope that we could actually see them moving towards more compassionate environments or is actually if you want to succeed in this economy is compassion too expensive well that's one of the reasons i wrote belonging um is that i i felt why is it just at the very elite level where some of these pretty amazing ways of leading people really empathetic, compassionate cultures exist, where the general population don't associate those with being successful. They see it as soft. Yes. And that's and that annoyed me, and it, it, it still does annoy me that why, you know, I've got two brothers who, you know, trades, tradesmen work their butts off. Why don't they get exposed to the same environment that maybe someone in the England football team would be exposed to well, why is that? You know, do you have to have some sort of crazy talent to get into some sort of particular environment in order to have this progressive style of way of being, um, you know, led? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. So that was a massive motivation for me to write Belonging was that I want to democratise these ideas. And, you know, it's been awesome. The book's only been out for a few months and the amount of feedback's been quite unbelievable. But a lot of it is, and most of it actually is from the business people saying, a lot of what we, you know, I felt as an individual was uncomfortable as an individual in managing and leading people. You know, you've put your finger on it, but you've explained a why, from an evolutionary point of view, that's not the way we used to do things. And secondly, you've explained the science as to why I've instinctively thought maybe this is a bad one. I, yeah, I've got an example where, you know, during the lockdown, during COVID, during re- the remote working shift, you know, you've probably heard about it yourself, but there's been this real um, you know, a myriad of examples of where businesses have installed software so that they can now track exactly where mm. their employees are spending their time on their computers, how much time is being on Google, what's on Google, Chrome, yeah. all the rest of it, and how much is on work stuff, which is the absolute opposite of trust, isn't it? Yeah. And what, what, but what, also what that does, so that might, someone who's selling that, software that might sound like a brilliant sales pitch you know this is much more efficiency much more productivity blah, blah, blah. that's what but from the employee's point of view it's a massive signal it's not even a micro signal it's a macro signal that we don't trust you yes. secondly it just creates an anxiety an absolute anxiety i mean you're going to be more anxious you're going to be more stressed you're going to have more cortisol going through your system when you know that's happening to you you're being watched effectively at home versus being trusted and given that autonomy that we crave. So I just think some of these things aren't thought through well enough from the culture, human performance point of view. I like that you talk a lot also about what makes a strong, successful leader. And it's in many ways the idea that it's those that have the consent of the team, not someone that just tells you what to do. Um, Even going back to when discussing sport, you mentioned how the players... um, They don't remember the specific meetings necessarily. They remember how you make them feel. So it is about, again, that belonging, that sense of Mm -hmm. unity. Um, And there's a lot of talk about how it's the combination of humility and professional will with a leader that makes for a successful one. And actually, I can think of a a great example at the moment. Um, As you might see from the light behind me, I'm a huge PlayStation fan. So I have an identity with PlayStation, but I'm not one of these people online that goes, PlayStation's amazing, Xbox is terrible. No, actually, I want them all to succeed. But the reason I mention this is because the head of Xbox, Phil Spencer, is a great example of a leader. He is a guy that he will go out there on interviews and he will happily talk about this PlayStation game. I played it. It was really, really great. Whereas PlayStation, who I'm a fan of, they're very much more, they come across as cold and calculative in terms of keeping their cards close to their chest only talking about what they do 
and I have more respect for the leader of you know a competing brand that is more just honest saying no I'm about gaming you know celebrating games and the culture um and of course he is trying to give he's doing that because it's going to hopefully do good brand awareness for Xbox obviously it's made me more affectionate towards it but again I do like that we are seeing this shift where um humility and these qualities are being seen as strengths um and you mentioned the idea of things being seen soft i'm a, a huge fan of um professor paul gilbert who wrote a book called the compassionate mind he, he runs the compassionate mind foundation and uh, i had the pleasure of speaking to him at one of his workshops and I'm, he's going to be coming on the show soon as well um, and he talks about the idea of compassion is traditionally seen. I need to stop using the word traditionally. I don't mean traditionally, but is usually used um, as a, a soft, nice thing. Like being compassionate is just, you know, there's no strength behind it. Whereas what he proposes is no compassion takes courage and strength. For example, when a firefighter has to break into a burning building to rescue someone, that is an act of compassion, but that requires courage and strength. And so there is a real battle of semantics and, you know, whenever we battle ideas, semantics do matter. I mean, when it's in government, it's, you know, you might be for civil liberties, but then a competing government might say you're weak on crime or you're weak on terrorism, whereas actually you need to com combat that by saying, no, we're strong on civil liberties and we're strong on your rights. And I do find that in mainstream discourse, the semantics are such a powerful battleground for getting people to embrace a sense of belonging and compassion with their fellow humans well i think in some of the high performing environments we're moving beyond soft um as, as a completely unuseful label to put on these ideas uh, so i'll give an example there are there are high performing teams out there around the world who would on a weekly basis take blood from their athletes and measure their hormone levels okay and the reason they're doing that is because this is this is the opposite of soft this is hard science is that they want to check on where the athletes are in terms of their anxiety levels so what they do is they're able to um, evaluate where their you know cortisol levels are the other stress hormones relative to dopamine um, which obviously is a really important uh, motivational hormone. Um, oxytocin, which obviously measures you know, the connection we have with people around us. Uh, serotonin, um, et cetera. So, so what they're doing is, you know, when a coach gives a, a speech which is positive, um, full of optimism, uh, very supportive, versus a coach that gives a speech which is, shouting at people telling them they're not good enough telling them that if they continue to do whatever they're doing then they won't they'll be removed from the team you know the opposite of belonging then they can show very quickly just through taking bloods that these this is a different hormonal state of those two athletes and it's pretty clear which is a preferential one especially when teams have to work you know when individuals are in a team because then the oxytocin for example is really quite important as opposed to probably when you're an individual athlete so that I, I sometimes when I'm talking to business groups, I actually show them this stuff. And I think it blows away any ideas about this is soft stuff. So in your context, what I'm saying is that when you show empathy and compassion to people, it fundamentally changes their hormonal state. It reduces their stress hormones. It increases their dopamine and oxytocin levels. And that gets us in a place where we are motivated and can trust the people around us and go for it. Well, so if we do the opposite, that some of that horrible sort of bullying type of behavior, we get these high stress hormones, low oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin levels, and we're in a completely different state and in a less optimal state to perform. So for me, those days have long gone when the labels of soft can be attached to it. Nobody can look at that and go, that's soft stuff. That is hard science. Yes. No, that's, that's really great to hear. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation about the idea of the jungle and you talk in the book about the sort of the, the nature of the jungle being unleashed. Um, I just want to make sure that I, I, I understood this right in the book. It's the idea that as we try and 
build senses of belonging with each other and support for each other, there's always that temptation because of the savage nature of um, the natural world um, that there's always a temptation to fend for, for yourself. I mean, you, you want to look out for yourself first before other people. So if our systems and our connections with others are damaged and we're then put into a situation where we've got to look out for ourselves, everything that we've built up before is then at risk? Is is that what it is to... In, in... Uh, I mean, I put it in a slightly different way. What, the way I put it is that we are built to belong with other people. We are built to be part of a group that provides us with safety, with well-being, with resources. We are wired for that. And and as part of the, our evolutionary story is that we have been parts of groups who have been very good at doing that. And we've had leaders and, and our peers who have had a clear sense of purpose about who we are and why we're here and our, and our identity. And we, we've always been vision driven about, you know, this is what we're actually trying to do together. What, 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 I, what I'm saying in the book is that when those things are absent and you just throw groups of people together without a sense of purpose, without a shared identity, without a clarity about what we're actually trying to do together, it's inevitable that people will be selfish. Because you'll look after yourself, because there is what, what is there to be selfless for? This is just a group of individuals. And I think, you know, with a lot of working environments, are fun, they might have the same company they work for on their employment contracts. They might come through the same reception. But are they actually a real, you know, community of homo sapiens or are they a bunch of people being thrown together and it's been sort of, you know, atomized in terms of this is what you as an individual need to do and you'll be paid for it. And a lack of relationships across the, those that group of people, that's not a natural state for us. So yeah, and, and you know, there's always the things that I talk about in the book around alphas. They're completely natural. Cliques are completely natural. They're not good or bad things. They're just natural part of being a primate. So we're always going to have alphas around and betas, and we're also always going to have cliques, and we're going to be attracted to cliques. And that's just part of this need to belong, as we want to keep going deeper and deeper into people who's more similar and more similar. If, especially when the environment's quite stressful. So these are all natural, but if you don't have good leadership, and I think, unfortunately, there's a predominance of it probably in the world, then in those environments, people, why wouldn't they be selfish? You best look after yourself because the group isn't going to look after you, so you better look after yourself. So that's ex the, probably the exact opposite of you know where I want to be with my work. Yeah, and and that will definitely be why there are some companies that have huge turnovers of employees because if you just go in there and it's very cutthroat, mm -hmm. you don't feel that you're contributing to the bigger picture. You feel dispensable, and so people are looking for an off ramp. And um, I can think of companies that I've been in that have been like that, and then others that I've wanted to stay with forever because um, there is yeah. a sense of we're all working towards something. So there is that aspect of longevity. Um, and, and, and off the back of discussions of leadership, you speak about the importance of like flattening hierarchies. It's not about getting rid of them, but it's at least having it. So there's more, um, there's more share of, of power. You, you talk about fairness and you say that there's a difference between obviously fairness and equality. Um, could you talk a bit about that, about that, that distinction? Yeah, and there's no, that's not, um, you know, my opinion. That's coming from, you know, Stanford University, Oxford University, the, the various studies to show that, you know, in our natural state, both from an evolutionary point of view, and if you look at hunter-gatherer societies today, they're actually very democratic. Um, they're very inclusive and, and equal. They're not dictatorships where someone's just taking charge and sort of running rampant. It doesn't work like that, as we spoke about earlier. That tends to happen when these sort of much bigger societies are built and much bigger corporations. Um, so we have an expectation in a group of fairness. Um, and I thought, you know, that's really was interesting to me to learn about that. Is that we don't necessarily we don't we we in order to belong we've got to feel that we are respected and we are seen, and that involves that we are treated fairly. There does a that's not the same that everyone is treated exactly the same and is equal, um, you know, in a more of a communist sort of approach. Um, that's what I learned about that. So if you think about it in, in a sports team or in a corporate team as well, not everyone's paid exactly the same. 
not everybody has the same job description. Not everybody probably gets the same opportunities um, and ha well, certainly has the same experiences day to day. People are okay with that, with differences in treatment, provided they feel that they are personally being treated fairly. But the moment when people don't feel they're being treated fairly, then their sense of belonging diminishes and they will look to leave the group. And, you know, so for example, if someone is getting more of a pay rise than someone else, but they can tolerate that as long as they feel they're being treated fairly. But when they feel that that's not fair, then they will lose that um, trust and that belonging and then they'll look to leave. And, you know, that's interesting in corporations when you see high turnover rates and people willing to leave for quite little or quite incremental levels of income somewhere else. And that shows obviously a sense that they didn't think it was fair and they didn't have a sense of a deep sense of belonging there. You also go into, when we think of interactions like, you know, who's getting paid more than others, um, you also go into the fact that there's this um, status shuffle that goes on where um, I think you say that, like, gossip is a, a social penalty. Um, and I think a lot about that with um, current social media platforms um i deleted twitter off my phone years ago and it's one of the best things i ever did because it really is just unfortunately cancerous in so many ways i mean i use it when i sit at my computer and the advice i give to people is use social media platforms when there's an intention so i sit at my computer to post something on twitter or to respond to something whereas when it's on your phone you're sort of passively drowning in it um and it can just be completely endless um sports I mean, in any industry these days, you know, social media is becoming increasingly an issue for mental health and well-being. Um, it's you, you talk a lot about the us stories, um, which I love that you say is shorthand for um, values. Um, I really liked that wording. And when you have people writing stories about you again and again, if you get lost in it, that can become your perceived reality and that can really shape who you are. Um, and I promise this is the last thing I mentioned actually about the Euro 2020, but it was a, an issue that was key on my mind because it was just a big part in the world at the moment, but especially during the tournament. Um, there was this us and them going between the players and some of the fans when it came to the decision to take the knee. They got booed in some matches um and there was no doubt lots of noise and conversation online about what is the role of a sports person is it should they are they there just to kick a football around just you know you're there to do the job not to bring politics into it and so england obviously put a, a statement out saying we're not doing this for politics we're doing this for anti-racism which i thought was great um how how do you prepare people on such a big stage because even people that don't have huge audiences can get lost with the negativity of social media. It's a, it can be a very distorted mirror, not only in what other people say, but what you post about yourself. And then when you're at the heart of an issue, which should be, in my opinion, a no-brainer, anti-racism is a good thing to make a statement on and is proven even more so by the reaction of particular people that were against it. But there's training... In that case, people to have a sense of belonging for the job that they're doing. But that's, I'm, I'm not saying this to be disparaging, I just can't think of a, a better term. But the taking the knee is kind of extracurricular. Um, and it's not to say it's not important, I think it is very important. But like that is something that hasn't had to be considered in previous training cycles. Yeah, well, I think in terms of this whole area of social media, maybe it's a bit simplistic, but the way I think about it is the stronger that you your sense of identity is, then the more resilient you will be to what people have to say to you. Mm. Um, and, you know, so, but whether it's a, an elite sports team, whether it's my two children who are 13 and 8, uh, you know, certainly what I want to do is help them, not force anything on them, but help them build their own identity story of who they are. And once you're sort of anchored around that, I think it makes a massive difference. I mean, a silly example would be if someone started going on about they didn't like New Zealanders. I don't care less. It's part of who I, 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 I am. 
and um, I'm really proud of it. I'm anchored by that. If someone says, you know, Owen Eastwood is a terrible performance coach, um, I'm not affected by that. I'm honestly not affected by that because I know that the people that I value and respect um, and work with and actually see me do my work, you know, give me positive feedback. And I'm far from perfect, but I know that I'm reasonably good at what I do. Um, so it's like we spoke about before. It's, it's, I, think, I think one of the things in life which is awesome and should actually be compulsory at school, probably around 11 or 12, is that everyone is taking on a journey to build their own sense of identity, including going back into all their beautiful different strands that have formed part of their heritage, having um, a space to talk about their experiences of good and bad in life and what that tells them about what values they want to anchor themselves to, and also giving them space to project how they want to live their life in the future and the sort of things they want to do and the type of person they want to be, the type of relationships they want to have. I'm not joking. I honestly feel like in that age group, that should be like three months or something spent just on that and forget all the other books because I think that helps you unbelievably in life. If you're not sure who you are and you're floating through, then you are, to me, highly vulnerable for people to say you're a bad person, you're a dumb person, you're unethical, whatever, all that crap. So so whether it's, yeah, again, whether it's my own kids, or whether it's the teams that I work with, we just build this beautiful story of who we are. And it's the best version of who we could be. And we're not going to be perfect on it every day, but it's something which is really cool. And it's very inclusive because it's not the same for everybody because we have our own different strands woven together to make it. But when we form a team, we are bound together by these same values. Um, but, you know, everyone has to go through that. And, you know, that's part of belonging the book is, is the story of when my father died when I was five. I was on a personal mission to figure out who the hell am I. He was part Maori, part English, and I'd lost those that connection. So I needed to go back and excavate and then build the story up again. And I've done that, and now I can pass it on to my children. Now it's for them to take whatever they wish from that and build their own identity. So that's how I approach all that stuff. It's, it's it's amazing and um i i have for many reasons so much respect with the work that you're doing and what you mentioned about what should be taught in schools i feel like after this conversation today if there were some ways that we could work together on sort of making that a thing i would love to because actually <laughs> before the yeah. pandemic um I, I did work on a scheme uh with youtube which i won't go into too much detail now because i did a whole episode with fellow educators on it um, but it was called Be Internet Citizens and it was teaching digital citizenship. And so I toured the UK. We went in schools. We had a full day. I had a class of, you know, 20, 30 kids and we taught them a curriculum, um, which included, you know, what fake news is. But then we went into a section about us versus them. We did one about um, talking about identity and uh the transfer I, I mean I hadn't done teaching before I mean I've taught workshops but teaching kids like that I've never mm -hmm. done before and it was the most rewarding experience ever and the transformation you could see in just one day so you talk about three months I'm with you completely I mean I'm always frustrated yeah. that the curriculum doesn't teach life skills you know things like first aid cooking relationships and consent Mm, paying yep. taxes finances you know I'm, I'm a free i've been a freelancer five years now and it was only because one of my parents showed me how to do self-assessment that i was able to do it i wasn't taught it in school and if i don't do it you go to prison um and yet you're not taught about it mm. um so like civics and things like that but the identity aspect and um there was one school we taught at and one of the classes at the end of the day we get them to do a creative exercise it could be a song or a poem about what they've learned today their favorite thing and then we chose some who wanted to do it in front of the whole school or their their, their, um, their year in the hall and there was a couple of instances where some of the kids were so moved that they actually came out about their identity and the, these these could be anything from 13 to 16 year olds like very young and there mm. was um someone who came out as gay never mentioned it before and obviously we support the teachers and let it know and make sure they get the support they need and then their fellow pu uh, fellow pupils would say oh thanks for sharing that like 
we like you for who you are and some some of these kids are the ones that may have been messing around loads and you you know are very closed off and you think they're just you know um that they're actually the most thoughtful and um just they're very introverted and um yeah i just wanted to share that because i do really believe that this idea of teaching it in schools is mm. imperative because that's how you change a culture um you, you you go against these things i mentioned earlier about like debates you know uh, when i did public speaking i didn't really like debating but it was all about who won the debate regardless of what the debate's about who won it um whereas we did exercises um one of them i'll share now quickly it was called going to mars and we were saying we're going to play a game now um we're going to split you into two teams so we go one two one two to split them up from their friends and that um one's like rover one's discover and one whoever wins this you go into mars after school and they're like really yeah 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 we've signed up for your parents all that sort of stuff <laughs> and then we would have two lists of like tools and skills and i would be with one of the teams and the um my um, co-facilitator would be with the other team one of them was quite tangible things like cooking um uh, technical skills like you know computer skills and then the other team had more like overall qualities like compassion or you know, thoughtfulness and uh we give them like three minutes to choose what are like the three four skills that you think are most important and then you're going to pitch it to the other team and we'd give them megaphones that have sirens on them and that and me and the co-facilitator we would um constantly egg each other on going oh your team hasn't written much down and they would say oh no actually we're way better than you and we would rile them up and then we let them pitch each other at this point so we do have a teacher in the room but we do have to give them a warning beforehand that it's going to get quite rowdy and they're at each other's throats we have to obviously make sure it doesn't get physical but these yeah. kids like really going for it and we build it up and we go right rebuttals now you've got 30 seconds go 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 and it gets more and more and then we go right everyone sit down um, and sometimes they're quite flustered. Uh, we watch a, a video about identity on YouTube to get them to calm down. And then they will always go, so who won? And we went, no one won. That's not what this was about. Uh, and then we basically make the point, how did you feel? And some of them say, I feel angry or, you know, I feel we were just better than them. And I go, but this was about going to Mars. This was a game. Like this wasn't going to happen. You knew that. And how aggressive were you? And they're like, oh, yeah. And we say, but imagine if that was about something that's a bit more intrinsic to society, maybe a religion or your nationality, something that's more core to your identity. How do you feel about that? And um, it is one of my favorite parts of the day because it goes to exactly what you say about the us versus them and sort of t t yeah. tailoring it back to what you mentioned in your book, the importance that the them shouldn't be necessarily other people. It should be the environment you know illnesses is and and that's really what we need to do and it goes to the heart of like what the quest for global empathy is it's can we create a, a global sense of belonging or is that too big of a thing to have a sense of belonging about do we need nation states and because the idea of belonging as a human race is 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 too big well <clears throat> and that's awesome mate. It really is <laughs> quite inspiring um, it, it, as Robert Sapolsky said, you know, us and them is part of how we are set up as a species. It's hardwired into our psyche. It's also caused oceans of suffering, um, but it is how we are hardwired. So for me, the constructive thing from that is we need to build an us story. And also there's no limits as to what us can be. And you touch on that yourself. I mean, that quote from Theresa May you mentioned is, you know, I find that depressing. I don't yeah. agree with it at all. The ultimate tribe is, is all of us. Yes. And maybe even even wider than that includes other animals, for example, other, other creatures, species, living organisms than just us. Why not? Okay. Why is that not one connected tribe? Um, whatever way you want to look at it. Uh, you know, also think about that classroom environment and also in coaching environments and, and probably team environments. Often what you, you can get to different approaches. One is someone will come in with the kids and say, these are the rules. Read them. Do you get any questions? Let me know. And so what they're trying to do, obviously, is they're trying to, to influence behavior. But then there is a different approach where the person comes in and says, 
let's build an identity of what this class could be this year. What an amazing, what would an amazing experience for all of us look like? You know, okay, we all learn, we all become better friends. We have fun. Um, you know, we, we learn, you know, we get to know more about ourselves, all of these things. So how, how would we create an environment for that to happen? Well, we'd need to have empathy, wouldn't we? We'd, had to, we'd need to have a level of kindness. We, 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 we couldn't bully, could we? So all, all of a sudden what you're doing is, is by taking an approach of let's build an identity to have an amazing experience together, you're actually getting to the same place. But instead of these rules dumped on people, of you're actually doing it in a much more inspirational way. And I suppose fundamentally in a lot of the work that I do, that's what we are trying to do. It's not dump rules. In fact, the New Zealand All Black Rugby team, you know, very, very successful for a long period of time. They don't have any rules. They don't have any rules. Right. They have an identity and they have an archetype of what it means to wear that shirt. And that is enough to govern awesome high standards and, and great team first behaviours. So could you give an example of a team that would have, like what kind of rules? Because obviously there's a time that they turn up for training, like that would technically be a rule. But like when you say they don't have rules, what would be a rule that a team that does have rules be that would well, still okay. work? Yeah. An example which you get in sports teams is lateness. Right. Which, you're talking about young, you know, males and females and it's sort of just and some of them are still teenagers when they get into elite environments, and some are well beyond that, but they're just not very good with timekeeping. But so lateness. So one team environment would have, if you are late, you will be fined X amount of pounds. Okay, so there's a prohibition and a sanction that goes with that. In another environment, to avoid lateness, it's set up as... If you're a good teammate, people need to be able to rely on you and they need to be able to trust you. And so if you're on time, people look at you and they go, yeah, solid, mm. trust. When you are late and people are waiting for you and then some days you're on time, what we are seeing is someone who's inconsistent and someone we can't really predict their behavior. What that means is it's really, really hard to trust so if we're going to grip, be, have a great experience here, we really need to trust each other a lot. And that, therefore, when we have a meeting to start on time, everyone needs to be here on time. And, you know, another aspect of that as well is that when you're in a team, you know, you really do respect each other's time. And if someone has to sit around in an environment waiting for somebody because they, you know, didn't get their act together or they were doing something they perceived more important, then that shows a disrespect to the people around you. So you, you can frame it in those ways. And I've, I've literally seen being part of both. And I'm telling you, you know, I actually think that the latter approach leads to higher level behaviours than threatening and fining people. In fact, I know it does. But, you know, still, there's a long way to go for a lot of teams to go there because it's quite easy, isn't it, to write a set of rules and sanctions and just stick them up there rather than having these conversations. Yeah, and rules... I think of laws a lot in society. They aren't. They they often aren't deterrents, um, even though they might say that they are. Um, and I'm thinking more recently, obviously, about the pandemic and when they um, opened up everything and said you you no longer need to wear masks. I felt they should have opened everything up, or tried to, and but said look, you still need to wear masks indoors. And then people talk about personal responsibility. Uh, but the idea of the mandate was um, the mandate is aimed for people that aren't personally responsible. Because if you're personally responsible, you're going to keep wearing it anyway. Now there's going to be a lot of people that aren't. And so I, in wider society, I've always been in a conflict about the idea of I think that if we nurture the right environment, rules will be need less and less. And this might be a very simplistic way of wording it, but I always feel that when a law exists, um, and I'll be interested to hear your uh, former lawyer mind responding to this, but I find that when a, a law exists, it's a failure to deal with the root cause of the problem in the first place. So for example, if you have a speeding limit on the road, it's because we've not worked out a way for cars to travel at that fixed speed or to travel safely where speed would become an issue that could cause harm to someone else. So automated cars of the future could solve that or having roads that are completely isolated from, you know, 
other sides of the road or collisions and things like that. Um, so I do feel yeah. that. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, but no, no. I think what I think what I've learned around that is again from an evolutionary psychology point of view. Um, when we've got small groups, we don't need rules. That's, and that's that, because of the the connectiveness and the, and the empathy that you can you, the people exactly. are there around you. There's more yeah. closeness, and, yeah. and, we're, and we're small enough to have an identity and to have an archetype and to self police. <clears throat> when you're building big cities, etc then I, I see, yes, you would need some rules in order to, to maintain order um, to, to some level. Uh, so I see a distinction between those smaller groups that we have evolutionary been used to operating in. And most of our working teams are, you know, 10, 15, 25, up 50-ish, you know, I can see a much less need for rules around that. And does that mean that if working with corporations, um, in performance coaching, um, if they are hundreds, thousands of employees, then it's just a matter of breaking them down into and dealing with them team by team. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I and mean, that, that, that is a big, big part of it, is to not making it feel like we're, you know, thousands of people, but actually, because ultimately what, what the culture of, of a thousand people is, is hard to define. But what's a lot easier to define is specific groups within the business. and what you're trying to do is make sure that they are of a high standard and are reasonably consistent, albeit they're going to be different because there's just different people involved. And in those smaller groups, then yeah, the route, the need for rules will be less if, if they're well led and well managed. But you know, if you're a crap manager and you're not very good at leading, then you will need a lot of rules because you're not going to be inspiring people and maybe you're not going to be role modeling things. And, and, and so that's how you're going to do it. And that's, so to me, if someone shows me, hey, I think I'm doing a great job, here's a bigger set of rules that I've sent to everybody, I'm like starting to yeah. go off. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah, I, I, I did reflect a lot when reading this about um, a, quite a big company I worked for a few years ago um, that it was after I had a head injury. And so I was in, I was recovering fortunately i mean it was serious but it like the physical side was dealt with pretty quickly but sort of the mental health aspects was um quite bad and it was working in for a, a very big organization very supportive in terms of you know giving me time off if i needed it and that but in the book you talk a lot about that when it comes to a sense of isolation and stress a lot of the symptoms of that is like tunnel vision anxiety all these things and I related to it so much because one of the things I always mentioned about when reflecting on my time at this company was every day I went in my tunnel vision got more and more to the point where I'd literally be looking at my laptop screen and I'd have people calling me and I just didn't even notice that they were speaking to me because every day mm -hmm. it was put headphones in listen to music try and get the work done um, because I feel like I'm behind because I'm not performing well enough and it only yeah. got worse and it, it sort of spiraled out of control and uh it is incredible the the physio the physiological impacts of isolation and um, on a more broader term, I, I think there's 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 always a, a difference between being alone and being lonely uh, in life. You can be someone that's in solitude, you know, you're by yourself and you're totally content, um, and there are people that could be at a party and feel incredibly alone, and so we have to really look at those distinctions as well. I think it was something that's emerging a little bit is during this COVID period, and it sounds very paradoxical, but some people f felt more alone when they were in the office with other people than they do at home. Like, and that might sound all, mm. how does that work? but the reason being is that when they're in an office, they, they didn't feel a sense of belonging. They, they felt like an outsider. They felt like they were always having to prove themselves in order to stay in the, in the tribe. Um, they were very, very anxious. Um, a lot of the time. Actually, what's happened is when they've come to be able to work from home, their anxiety levels have reduced. These are just some people, but I'm hearing about it. I've heard about it a bit more recently. Um, their anxiety levels have reduced being at home in an environment which I feel comfortable in. They never ever would hear from their, their regional manager or the chief executive or whoever, really. They'd never see them, you know, in real life. Now, actually, there's a weekly call where everybody is able to listen to the, the ultimate leader and talk about you know, how things are going. 
and actually even though it's sort of online they actually feel like they've got some deeper relationship with those leaders now because they get to hear from them and they get and especially if they're a bit vulnerable for example and definitely showing you know empathy um you know and and some of the group conversations online you know if they're set up in a certain way are actually been really really good at getting to know people a bit differently as well and, and a bit more about their background and, and how they're feeling and there's been a space created to be a bit more vulnerable than people ever would have in the office so i 100 percent agree you know being alone and being lonely are, are different things and you know you don't just have to feel in isolation to have tunnel vision i mean tunnel vision is a symptom of you know suffering from you know stress and with guys in particular, not only tunnel vision, but also we just stop communicating with people around us. Um, I think more than females probably do. And you know, these are really, really not great behaviors if you want to have a high performing team to individuals have tunnel vision and also the communication to start. To. So that's another reason why I mentioned earlier, we want to have calm environments and have consistent environments. We want to have a lot of clarity and we want to have a lot of evenness. Um, and that's, that, that reduces the chance of tunnel vision and the communication breaking down as well. Oh, yeah, I do, I do look with embarrassment at how I was. I, I do look back with compassion on myself, like I was not in a good place, but I do also feel like I was just mm. totally out of it and not myself. And clearly I'm well, and I'm glad I'm in a much better place now. But mm. it's... Um, all been an experience. I mean, that sounds, you know, like a very tough experience. Yeah. Um, very harsh situation to be in. And, but I think we've all been in situations of varying degrees around when we've been overwhelmed with, with stress, you know, anxiety. Um, and it's a, it's a friggin' horrible feeling. And I think what people don't really appreciate is how much our environment contributes to it. A lot of it, it gets put on your personality. You're an anxious person, you know, that's just the way that it is. But, you know, there's that insight from the English Institute of Sport that 70% of behaviour is determined by whatever environment you're in. Right. So if seventy percent of your you know, behavior, your mindset's shaped by your environment, then it means everything. And I know as a parent, you know, my goodness, it is, it is sobering. It's it's humbling how your tone, your mood, your energy affects their mindset and therefore their behavior. You do, know, you that, do you so feel that? Do you feel that? If I come into the room and I'm, hey, how are you? Have a good sleep, you know. What, what do you got on today? Oh, fantastic. And I'm present, you know, I'm not with my device or anything. I'm present. I'm looking them in the eye. They, they have a complete hormonal reaction. You know, their stress will go down, their oxytocin, dopamine levels go up. They're feeling frigging great. Um, but if I come in and I'm in a, you know, and I'm, and I'm stressed out and I'm looking at my phone and I'm not acknowledging them I'm, I'm, and I sit over in the corner and I'm, you can, you know, you know, it. You, you literally feel the stress from this one individual in your space and it literally triggers your own stress response and everybody closes and tightens. It's been horrible. And, 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 and again, these are all these environments we work in, but also at home, it's the same deal. So again, you know, I'm trying to do my best influence environments where we, we minimize that. It's going to happen sometimes. That's fine. We're going to have bad moments and things are stressful in life, but try and mi minimize it. So when it happens, okay, we've sort of got a bit of a strategy around how we cope with it rather than that being the sort of norm or it's just being completely unpredictable. And I suppose in team building, it, maybe House of Cards would suggest it's more fragile than, than I intend, but to improve an environment for a team to function in, the team members themselves are actually the environment to each other. So it's that thing yes. of if, if there is fractures with someone that can then mm. negatively impact someone else. And so it's important that everyone remains as a strong pillar in this overall team environment. Yeah. I mean, there's important research, you know, showing that from your, from your, adolescence on the most influential people in your life are your peers not authority figures and my son's just he's 13 and I, you know i can 100 percent see it so from my point of view my number one concern with him is his group of mates now and, and as it happens it's not a concern because I, I i think they're great and <laughs> I'm, really, awesome. I'm really pleased about it but and when i look back at my own story my own journey i i believe i could have gone in all sorts of different directions no problem at all i really do yeah there's no way i was ever destined to do what i'm doing now no way but i did have a great set of mates who were just good good guys a lot of fun have a lot of 
adventures and laughs together, but they're all actually very motivated. And when it came to schoolwork, they were at high standards. You know, some of, some of them were a hell of a lot smarter than me, and some of them struggled. But none of them were a complete disaster or disruption in the classroom. They all had good standards about turning up and doing your thing. And they are the things that really shape behaviour fundamentally more probably than even teachers. So, you know, with my son, with anybody. So, you know, and again, if we go into a sports environment, if everyone's in little cliques, you know, it, it, it really is conducive to, to that distrust and that, and that anxiety and stuff. So we've got to break those up as best we can as well. So it's the same thing as, it's, it, you know, people talk about Gareth Southgate and, and all these leaders, and that's cool, and they're important. But I'm telling you, it's your peers. It's the peers around, you know, Raheem Sterling and Kane and, 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 and those guys, um, Tyrone Mings, all, you know, great guys. They're, they're the, they are the key to the culture, in my personal point of view. And if they're all lined up and pointed in the same direction and got high standards and good, empathetic, compassionate people, then we're going to have a pretty freaking good experience together. Yeah. So, so growing up, did you have one core group of friends or? Yeah, I was from a little village. Um, so I had, yeah, we, we all knew each other. I mean, we really, we only had one school in the whole area. Everyone went there. So you, you knew everyone. But I, I had a real solid group of mates from actually even before school. I had some good friends from about three, what we call kindergarten through. And then it, it evolved over time, of course. High school, it evolved quite a lot. And then at university, it evolved quite a lot. But, you know, my best friends still come from growing up together. Um, they've done all really cool stuff in their own rights. And um, so, yeah. But, you know, some people are different. Some people are possibly a bit more transactional around friendships. You know, I'm not sure, but I'm probably a bit old school about it. But I, I think I was also just lucky. I mean, and I could have gone in, as I said, if I could have gone in with a bad group, happened to be in my year. Because I know sometimes you're at school and you have a good year and, and the year behind, you may be not as good. And all these things are a bit random, aren't they? So that's why, even though I think my son's awesome, I don't take anything for granted. You know, I want him to be surrounded by good people. Of course. Um, yeah, no, the reason I asked that was because, and it kind of touches back to the whole idea of being alone versus lonely is throughout my life, I've always been very, um, much, I, I just get on with everyone. I like the freedom of going to different groups and getting on with people. And I think the advantage of that is flexibility. Um, it gives me a lot of social confidence with any situation I can kind of deal with. But there are negative sides as well. And like a negative, I would recall when I was at school, for example, in my year in secondary school, um, we would have groups. We had like the rowers. We had like the rude boys. Um, we had like the people that were more geeky. We had all these different groups. And I got on with all of them. So mm -hmm. in some ways, like there was this sense of belonging with them. You know, I can get on with everyone and this is really great. The negative side is whenever someone had a birthday party or something like that, I would never get invited because I was never identified as one of their groups. And that is something that I've even taken through into my adult life. And it's something I'm content with. Um, and sometimes I question, like, have I just have I done the social aspect just wrong? Have I just got it wrong completely? Um, but it is this weird dichotomy of, like, I feel this strength in... Um, being able to belong very quickly to groups um and i wonder if that kind of maybe relates to the work that you do because you're going you know as a performance coach to a team you're having to not just you know teach about you know these philosophies of belonging and that but you need to also belong with the team that you're working with and then you're going on to different projects like is there a challenge there that you find oh. or Definitely. I, I, I'm a shy person, probably an introvert to, you know, to a degree. Um, so, you know, me just, I'm, I'm certainly not an extrovert, so I don't just turn up in an environment and say, look at me. I'm, I'm, the, opposite. <laughs> I'm the opposite of that. And I'm, with my job, unfortunately, that's a little bit about the way it is, because when, when I do turn up, people do look at you and listening to you and they're wanting to, to be, in, you know, learn something, I suppose, and, and to come up with some fresh ideas. So no, I don't, in every environment I go into, I'm as susceptible to micro signals as other people. Um, so no, it takes time normally. I mean, you know, and, and the, but it gets to, you know, normally gets to a beautiful place where you feel you belong. 
but it's not an automatic. It's not that it doesn't happen automatically. It's, it's built like everybody else and every other group around us. It's built on relationships. It's built on those micro signals, and also the way that you know I I also impact on it myself. You know I've got to come with energy. I can't just turn up there and expect everyone to love me. I've got to pr prove myself to a degree, I suppose, but. Um, I've got to give them something back as well. And I'm very conscious of that. And I'm conscious of one other thing too. Yeah. My daughter's tennis is just about to finish and I've got to go and pick her up. And I, if, I, if she's in the car park feeling isolated, um, I feel like a bit of a hypocrite in terms of um, <laughs> everything I've been talking about. So I better not leave her there. But that's you know, cool. Well, we, we've I'm with you, Miles. You, um, got so much respect for what you're doing and your whole way you're, you're wired up. I, no, I, re I really appreciate it. And to be honest, we were, we were getting towards the end anyway. So um, we I feel like we could talk for another couple of hours. I mean, this time has absolutely flown by. Um, is there any final thing you want to you plug? Obviously, the book, Belonging, um, is out now. Um, I highly recommend people check it out. The uh, the, the version I got uh, was actually a black cover. Oh, it's nice a, this, I, love, I mean, I'm a fan of black. So, like, this is this is really awesome. But, I mean, so, in New Zealand and Australia and South Africa and other countries, it's black and it's a paperback. And in the UK and I think the States, it's a white hardback until the paperback comes out next year. So, um, yeah, so I'm not sure what... Anyway, that's a publisher's decision. But, no, look, um, the book is told, as you know, there's a bit of sharing. There's three things, really, I think. One is it's sharing some ancient wisdom, which I think is as equally applicable today as it was thousands of years ago. Secondly, is there some the science? We just touch on it. I'm not, not a scientist, but we just touch on the science that sort of um, it reaffirms that lovely wisdom. And then the third, and bit, which is the biggest part of the book, is multiple stories. I, I think, I'm not sure, something like 28 different stories. Um, probably most of which I, I was personally involved in, but quite a few that I wasn't, um, to actually bring these to life. And, you know, I've written the book as a coach. So I don't say these are the five things you must do tomorrow, go away and do it. What I do is I try and provide insight and stories, but ultimately it's for you to figure out what you want to do and who you want to be. And I'm just there to be a sort of a guide for part of the, part of the adventure. It's, it's, it's really an amazing read and uh, I was so excited to um, have the chance to have this conversation with you today. So, um, yeah, I mean, I will drop you an email afterwards, no doubt. But um, yeah. if there was some way that we could work together, because I, I definitely feel we're very aligned on this. Yeah. And I do feel that this is something that needs to be taught more widely um, to just nurture uh, and a more compassionate society. And it yeah, is a generational thing. And it's great that you brought this, you know, to the audience's attention as well, because um, there's the glamour around all these sports teams and all the rest of it. But, but what actually people should be taking away is there is a different way of creating our environments and the, the way they're led and the connection we can have with each other and the opposite of the process and efficiency and, um, you know, using technology to everything and actually just base it on frigging great relationship. Awesome. Owen. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Well, staying in touch and um, thank you again. Definitely. Cool. Thanks, dude.